Howdy everybody. Hope you're doing well today. Mr. Bob, your neighborhood naturalist. I'm Bob Langston from the North Carolina Zoo. It's been two weeks since the last time we spent any time together. and As you can see, some of the trees around have started losing a lot of their leaves, even though today is a very, very warm and, uh, and humid day as well. We're going to take another little field trip today. Uh, last month, about a month ago, uh, on the 14th of October, I uh, did a little cleanup and service project and nature hike with some folks out at the Pisgah Covered Bridge. Now many folks are aware of the Pisgah Covered Bridge and a little bit about the geography and, and things, water flow if you will, uh, of Randolph County. Randolph County is, is basically a big rectangle and uh, sort of uh, to the north and the uh, east side of the, the county, um, that river basin is the Cape Fear Basin. So the Rocky River and the Deep River, those all feed down and they become the Cape Fear River flowing out into the ocean. On the western and uh, sort of southwestern side of the county, uh, were part of the Yadkin PD Basin. Now the Pisgah Covered Bridge was originally designed as a wooden covered bridge to traverse the uh, western fork of the Little River. The Little River has a bunch of different forks, a bunch of different branches all through the western side of the county and uh, a lot of it covers some agricultural area as well. The uh, covered bridge itself crosses this, uh, 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 is right next to Pisgah Covered Bridge Road. Before the road was paved, it was a dirt road. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the covered bridges and kind of why they're significant and everything else. At the present, there are two historical covered bridges. Most of these were built in the uh, mid 1800s and uh, they uh, were designed to last for about 100 years. Some did, some may have gone a little bit longer. But anyhow, uh, they were designed specifically with kind of two purposes in mind. The cover on the bridge was usually made out of cedar, and as we've talked, cedar wood uh, has a lot of oil and a lot of resin in it that gives it uh, resistance to moisture and resistance to insects. So that course sort of guaranteed it would have a little bit longer lifespan. And uh, the uh, cover on the bridge could keep the boards from uh, rotting. And that's kind of an important thing because this, uh, most of these were built long before we had any sort of the moisture treatments that we do now, the pressure treatments and things for lumber. So we'll get into that. The other reason is a little bit, a little bit less obvious. Horses sometimes have a nasty habit, and mules especially, of spooking. And if you happen to have a wagon full of dried corn that you're taking to a mill to get ground up, or dried wheat, or even cotton, or other agricultural crops, you don't want your horse or your mule to spook and drag that wagon into the river, the creek, or whatever it's crossing. The cover uh, not only provides a physical barricade, but it also provides some comfort to the horse because their eyes are seeing sideways and they can tell that there's something consistent over there. Now there are a couple of secondary reasons why the covered bridges were always deemed important, and I'll get into that when we get over there. So let's take a little ride. We're going to go over to the covered bridge. It's over on the southwestern side of the county. This is the Pisgah Covered Bridge. So come on, let's take a little ride. This is the West Fork of the Little River. How kind of hard to believe that this placid, peaceful stream could become a raging, massive whitewater river, but that's exactly what happened in August of 2003. A flash flood uh, came along and completely washed the uh, covered bridge off its stone footers and deposited wood all along the riverbed downstream from where we are now. Even though I mentioned that a lot of the covered bridges found across the United States were built in the 1800s, the Pisgah Covered Bridge was originally built between 1910, 1911. The original cost to build a bridge is only about $50, the restoration probably a little bit more. I also said that the coverings on the bridge, the roof and sides, served a lot of different purposes. Uh, they helped keep water off the bridges. It also helped uh, keep the bridge from getting slippery in the rain so that wagons, horses, and mules wouldn't necessarily slide off and get wet. Uh, covers also help prevent skittish animals from doing a bolt into the river, and that would damage, them, you know, damage anything that was in the cart they were hauling, but it would also keep from hurting the animals. Now, the side coverings provided a little bit of shelter and an interesting benefit, too. 
Many young sweethearts often met on covered bridges, hoping that those sides would provide a shelter and give them a little privacy from disapproving parents. This last feature I mentioned is much of the legacy of the Pisgah Covered Bridge. See, generations of Valentines have identified their love interests under the timbers of the bridge. But there is, however, much more to the Covered Bridge site. There's a relatively flat trail that covers a quarter of a mile along the shores of the Little River. So join us as we discover some of the plants and some very cool mushrooms as we hike this little trail. We're down on the west end of the bridge right now, and this is very close to the road here, Pisgah Cover Bridge Road, and you can see right here on the shoulder of the highway these beautiful purple morning glories. We have several different varieties around Randolph County, and since we happen to be there late in the morning, early in the afternoon, these are starting to close up, so you can see how they form this nice trumpet-shaped flower. This bright yellow mushroom happened to catch my attention, and I'm not quite as good at identifying fungi as some folks. The uh, North Carolina Zoo has a person working for us in the Conservation Education and Science section, so i got to give a big shout out to Betsy Rosnick who helps me identify these. We'll come back to this one in a little bit. Because the trail is so low in the watershed, that means it's close to the stream bed, it's very damp and moist here, so we get lots of fungi. We also get lots of mosses, like this uh, little miniature forest of a moss that's growing right here. This interesting looking stuff here isn't actually a moss, it's kind of a lichen, and a lichen is a two-part organism. Uh, a lot of times it's a uh, blue-green algae that grows inside a, a fungi, but uh, it's kind of an interesting plant. It's an epiphyte. It doesn't actually uh, take any nourishment from the soil or the trees. It just sort of anchors there. I may have said this before, but one of the things that uh, you see often in nature is that as soon as you're no longer living, somebody wants your resources. And this is what we see here. We've got an old dead tree. I believe this is a red cedar tree that was down by the water's edge. And the tree is long gone, but look at all this fungus that's decided to move in and uh, live on what's left of the tree trunk. The day we were out doing this particular walk was in the autumn of the year, so there's a lot of brown on the ground, and you'll also see that there's an awful lot of uh, green. Some of the, the plants haven't lost their leaves yet, but these yellow mushrooms really do tend to stick out, and they do catch your attention as you're walking along the trail. Many things out in the woods, when they're left alone for a while, become homes for other things, and sometimes they can be even a little artificial. What we're looking at here is one of the creosote-covered railroad ties that helps mark the trail out here at the Pisgah Covered Bridge Trail area. You notice this one is covered in this moss, but if you look in this crack in here, you'll notice there are critters coming and going. Yellow jackets aren't my particular favorite insects because they have a nasty habit of getting stung. I don't mind watching them from afar, and so we're going to use the zoom on my camera here to get a little bit closer and watch these yellow jackets coming and going from their home in the woods. Back to our yellow mushroom, as I mentioned we get back here. When you see this part of the mushroom sticking up out of the ground, this is actually sort of the flower of the fungus. 
The mushroom itself holds the spores and helps the uh, fungus reproduce. Much of the organism, the fungi itself, lives underground. We get a quick look at these next two. This nice triangular shaped leaf here belongs to a plant called wild ginger. This pretty little plant is called striped wintergreen, or its more fun name is called Pipsissawa. More mushrooms as we walk along the trail. Now most of the fungi that we find out here are helping to break down the leaves and the wood of a lot of the materials that die and fall to the forest floor. In that case, they help to recycle nutrients and uh, put that back into the soil. It didn't take long after this tree uprooted and fell over along the trail for the community of mosses and fungi to move in and start cycling the nutrients. There are probably insects in here as well. Now, I've heard these particular mushrooms referred to as bracket fungus or tree ears, but uh, they just kind of have an interesting appearance. So I thought I might take a little bit closer look. Meanwhile, on another part of the same tree, this is the same tree that had the, the um, tree ears on it, the bracket fungus, and down on the root ball, we happen to have this little interesting community of uh, mushrooms and mosses that are sort of taking up their home in the roots of this tree. Now this one is a really cool find. Uh, I've only recently become aware of these types of mushroom and fungi. This is what's called a coral mushroom. And as we get a little bit closer look, you can see that the part of the mushroom that's growing up above the ground does in fact look like a coral you might find deep in the ocean. And just like that, the loop trail brings us right back to the Pisgah Covered Bridge. So what do you think? A really cool old historic bridge that has some significance still today, plus lots of really cool plants, fungi, and even a couple of animals or two, okay? Yellow jackets, I know, I'm usually not very complimentary, but it was kind of nice getting to watch those coming in and going out. So, a couple of things that are happening. The North Carolina Zoo is open to the public. You do still need to take all of your COVID precautions, and that means making your uh, reservations, to your, a time to enter the park, you need to purchase your tickets in advance. So those are big deals. Masks are required. And also, one of the things I wanted to mention is we will be doing uh, on uh, two weekends in December, a little bit of a modified Believe event. You can find out about that. It's sort of a holiday flavored thing. You can find out more about that by visiting our website at www.nczoo.org. That'll give you all the details and everything. When you land on our homepage, there's lots of information that you can follow. So please come see us when it's not quite as humid as it is today, when the weather's a little bit cooler and nicer. The animals are very active and they look forward to seeing you as well. We do and hope you have the chance to join us the North Carolina Zoo. I'm Mr. Bob, your neighborhood naturalist. For the zoo, Bob Langston. Take care of yourselves, get outdoors, enjoy nature, and find out a little bit about something you don't know when you go. We're students of natural history. That's what it means to be a naturalist. Take care, guys. I'll see you again in about two weeks.